All right, good morning. Hello, everyone. I'll give you all a moment while the audio connection becomes a firm connection. Thanks for joining us. Welcome again. My name is Doug Cook. I'm the Education Events Coordinator for NOFA Mass. Welcome to Encouraging Indigenous Microorganisms with Marco Thomas. We'll get started first by um, acknowledging the land that we are all inhabiting and its long history of inhabitation um, long before European colonization. We use this map to remind you that you can learn more about the people um, who have occupied this land for so long by clicking on the area which you live in and following the links to learn more about their structures and struggles, ongoing struggles. We also want to remind you that you'll be entering on mute and we will invite you at times to come off of mute, perhaps to ask questions and just remind uh, or, and remember to put yourself back on mute to preserve sound quality. Um, you're also invited to introduce yourself in the chat and ask questions um, so that we can have a nice conversation. We'll, I'll keep monitoring those questions and uh, bring them up as as they are needed or hold them off um, to the end. And as a, remember, uh, a reminder, we are also recording the session so that you can view it at a later date. We of course thank our sponsors who are helping to make this conference possible and all the NOFA work. We encourage you to visit their sponsor, visit these organizations and learn more about some of the great work they're doing. We also have an online auction. If you haven't checked it out, get on over there. There's some really cool items for you to bid on. And of course, during um, in between sessions, when you're not bidding on your auction items, you can check out our virtual vendor room and learn more about their excellent work as well. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Marco Thomas. Marco has been teaching about indigenous microorganisms um, and natural farming techniques. He has founded Mar Microbes by Marco uh, and produces handcrafted beneficial microbe and nutrient inputs for your garden based on the principle as do as nature does. Thanks for joining us, Marco. Good morning, thank you for having me. Uh, can you hear me okay, Doug? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, great. Uh, as Doug mentioned, my name is Marco Thomas. Uh, I do natural farming methods. Um, and gardening for me has been pretty much an advanced hobby. Professionally, I build high rise buildings. I'm a project manager. And I've been doing that for over 20 years. And parallel to that, I've also been uh, farming and uh, gardening and using many methods of doing so. My, my gardening uh, started pretty much as a young child. I, I spent a lot of time uh, being outdoors. I love nature, just doing things that young kids do in nature. I was always in, in the woods and searching and seeking out, you know, different critters and animals. Uh, so natural farming just kind of became a progression for me over the years as I learned how to cultivate plants and food. I was looking for the most, uh, for the cleanest way to grow uh, my plants and my food, uh, especially when you're growing things for, uh, when you're cultivating for uh, medicinal plants or even food crops, you really don't want to use any chemicals, uh, fertilizer, or anything really man-made. And natural farming what that does is, is it gives you options looking at nature in order to grow your food and to uh, cultivate your, your plants. So what, what actually is natural farming? Uh, natural farming for me, and, and, and what it is, is it's a method of cultivating your plants that predates the time when, when man first started using chemicals and when we first discovered that you could grow plants with chemicals. So you can, plants will grow fine with chemical fertilizers. However, 
whatever you're growing your plants with, ultimately you're, you're putting into your own body by consuming those plants. So in the natural farming uh, world, we like to focus on uh, not using any chemicals. And the main focus is the collection of indigenous microorganisms. So you ask, what are indigenous microorganisms? Just as the name implies, uh, these are microorganisms that live in the soil and local healthy forests that, uh, that have relationships with the trees and plants and basically are responsible for the health and the growth of, of the forest. Uh, if you ever look at a forest, you can see that it's healthy. No one ever had to put fertilizer on that forest uh, and, and everything is growing very well. And the reason why is because nature has its own system down where in the fall, trees drop their leaves. Those leaves are then uh, hit the forest floor and they be, start to become uh, shredded and, and broken down by the forest, uh, the, the members of the uh, forest floor, the soil. Uh, starts out with sort of your uh, soil millipedes, your isopods, your roly polies. They start getting in there and shredding this leaf material up. And from there, it it's becomes available for, for other uh, soil members such as earthworms to now come in and start consuming what those shredders had just, uh, had just broken down. So part of the, so with indigenous microorganisms, um, you may say, how can I get those into my garden? And there's a couple of different ways to do that. One of the easiest is a method called uh, Jadam Microbe Solution or JMS. And this is just as simple as uh, visiting a forest or, or park or even areas right around your yard or property where you see strong uh, vegetative growth. And what you do is you're basically going to pick up anything on the forest floor, such as fallen logs, uh, leaf mold, anything where you're seeing a lot of uh, it looks like white. And what that white is, is, is mycelium or fungal hyphae or it could, um, could also be a uh, uh, actin of, uh, of uh, bacteria, excuse me. So you want to pick up these uh, items that look like, for lack of a better word, mold or uh, fuzzy growth. And you can collect these items and bring them back to your property. And what you do is you combine these, uh, these mold uh, forest floor items that you uh, collected and you add those to a bucket. And in that bucket, you wanna fill the contents with water. Rain water is preferred, but definitely water without chlorine. And basically you're gonna take these, <clears throat> these items you collected combined with water. And now you have a solution which has microbiology from the forest floor and the water. However, we wanna cultivate these microorganisms and have them grow. So to do that, we have to add a simple food source. And for JMS, potato starch is a great food source. What, when you're growing microorganisms, you don't want to feed them with artificially rich uh, sugars or ingredients. A lot of people like to give, use molasses when they're brewing microbes, and that's fine. However, I feel like you're gonna get a much stronger microorganism when you grow them with things such as potato, because it's a lot uh, more difficult. Uh, it's a simpler starch. So it's kind of the same as if you were to always, uh, you know, if you, if the term, you know, spoil a child. If you always give that child exactly what they need, exactly when they need it, it they don't really become tough. They don't, uh, they're not uh, adapted well when things don't go their way. And I look at it the same way with your microorganisms. If you grow them with a simple starch, then you're growing a strong, tough microorganism that when, when you put that microbe into the soil, it's more likely to survive. When you grow microorganisms with molasses, to me, you're given an artificially rich environment, which when it reaches the soil, 
those microorganisms most likely may not live because they've got that rich sugary environment which they were cultivated in. So back to the JMS, you've taken those items you collected from the forest, you fill your bucket with the rest of the way with water. And now what you wanna do is take a boiled potato as your starch and knead this boiled potato and the, and the pieces of, and the organic material that you collected, knead those into a, into a bucket of water and using a mesh bag to kind of contain the pieces of sticks, leaves and mold along with the potato. So you need all that, all that together. And then now you're basically just going to let that water sit. And what will happen is it'll look pretty much just like brown water on day one. And then about 24 hours into it, you'll notice a foamy, uh, some foam start to appear on the surface. And what that foam is, that is telling you that your microbiology is now is active. Those bubbles are the growth of the microbiology letting off gases. So after about 24 hours, you'll see the uh, foam start to appear and you wanna monitor it and you want to harvest this solution when that disc, when that foam on the surface creates a full disc. So it'll look like a, just a foamy disc or almost like the head on a beer if it was a flat beer where it's just foamy. And that's the key because when that disc is at its full, is, is at its fullest, the microbes are ready to be uh, harvested and watered into your garden. So timing is key. After the disc starts to break up, that's an indication that your microbes are now consuming all of your starch, which is your potato starch, and now they're starting to degrade. So when you're making a JMS, uh, timing is key roughly 36 hours, depending on how hot it is or cool it is. And the indicator is your disc, uh, the ring of bubbles. So now once you've created this JMS, Jadam microbe solution, this can now be watered directly into your soil at full strength if there are no plants growing. And if you have plants growing, I dilute it by about half, which I'll use, um, half of this solution we created and then I'll combine half rainwater and then now I water that into my soil. And that's a really simple way to increase the microbiology in your soil and add a little bit of diversity. Uh, when we're working with microbes, diversity is the key. One of the, um, one of the biggest questions or the questions I get the most uh, when collecting microbiology from the forest, a lot of people wonder, is this, is this safe? Are there bad microbes? And is there anything to worry about? Uh, one of the principles of Jadam, and I'm sorry if I didn't show this. This is the book I'm referencing when I'm talking about Jadam. It's their orange book. Look for a second edition. This is a great book. This is a wonderful way to start right here has a lot of recipes on the things I'm talking about. And then they also have a new book, which is this one that I just got. And this one has a lot of pest control and discusses things like that. I won't necessarily get too deep into that, but I will mention a couple of the, um, a couple of the pest control things that we can do uh, naturally. So uh, back to our indigenous microorganisms. We've uh, just made our JMS, which is a Jadam microbe solution. And we're watering that into our soil, and that's great. We've added some diversity. We're building our populations of microbes in our soil, and that is good, but we want to continue to take that a step further. Um, JMS is one way to collect those microbes. Another way would be uh, a rice collection. And what that method is, you take rice, which has been partially cooked, not to the point where it's sticky and mushy, but just a little bit firmer than you would like to eat it at. And what you do is uh, you create, a, you, you build a, either a wooden box or take a wicker basket, or you can use a cardboard box as long as you poke some holes in it. And basically what you, what the box or the basket is, is a vessel to hold this rice collection. So you'd like, so what you want to do is cook your rice, 
put a layer of one to two inches of rice in, in the container that you choose. And now you want to go to a forest, which is not far from your, from where you grow in your same region, preferably close to your property, closer than farther. And what, what you'll do is you'll put this rice in this collection vessel, which is the box, and you go to a, an area of very big trees where you have strong uh, growth of strong forest growing. And you want to clear out a space on the for forest floor where you can place this box. The idea is that the rice being a simple starch and a moist environment is a good uh, medium to collect microorganisms from the forest floor. And the way you do that is you scrape down into the leaf duff. You know, when you go out in the woods, you scrape down, you'll notice loose leaves and then you scrape a little further you get to a point that looks really, there's a lot of roots and it really looks webby. Uh, it's, it's hard to kind of break down through that any farther. And that's the um, spot on the, on the forest floor where you really want to collect your microorganisms. So you clear down into this below the leaf duff and now you place your box of rice or whatever your collection or whatever you're using, box or basket. And now you're basically wanting to cover that with some kind of tote, a plastic bin. And, what, and the reason for that is you don't want rain getting into this. You don't want it to rain down onto your rice. You don't want animals uh, coming into your rice collection and, and disturbing it or eating it. So, uh, and so basically now you've placed your box, you've covered it with your tote, and now you want to wait. In this heat that we've been having, it's hot, it's the middle of summer. My experience tells me it will take about three days of collection time before you have a suitable um, IMO collection. And so what, that, so what that means is you wanna give it about three days and then check on it. And now when you check on it, what you're looking for is you're looking for, ideally you'd like to see uh, a, a white fuzz all on your rice. There will be various different colors speckled into that. And what is what that is, is each of those different colors are different clusters of indigenous microorganisms that you, they grew into that rice. You know, these microbes are so tiny that they're airborne on, on that small level. You know, when just think about when you see, you know, dust blowing through the air, you know, that's not just soil and dirt and dust. There's also microbiology in that. So we are always breathing in microbiology. It's all around us. It's everywhere. And what you want to do with that rice collection is now you've collected what grew up from that forest floor into your rice. And so now that is called IMO1, Indigenous Microorganism 1. So what we have to do though, is we've collected that, but if you were to just leave that rice untouched, the biology would continue to grow. And what would happen is you would lose balance in that collection and certain uh, microbes would dominate. And then eventually you'd have a collection, which is mostly, I guess you'd say ruined because you've lost the diversity in it. So what you want to do is once you make that collection, you've gone back and picked up your rice. It looks great in three days. It's fuzzy. It's, it's nice. So now you want to store those microbes and, and, to a, a, and, and put them into uh, dormancy so that you can use this IMO collection later on. And the way to do that is you take, you weigh your rice that you've collected your IMO in, you do a weight of that and you add equal weight of unrefined sugar. And by unrefined sugar, I mean sugar like uh, Demer Demerara or uh, Jaggery, which is my favorite, or there's uh, sugar in the raw, which is good. And what you, the reason you don't wanna use white sugar is because white sugar is basically sweetener that has all the nutrients and, and uh, 
and nutrients stripped from it, which is not why it's now white. So basically you end up with molasses and then white sugar. Be careful as well with your sugar because some late sugar that's marked brown sugar is nothing more than white sugar with molasses added back into it. So look for your raw forms of sugar. They're gonna have the most nutrients in them and they're gonna be the most uh, the least refined and they'll be the best, uh, best way to store your collection. So once you've weighed your rice, combined your equal weight sugar, mixed it up to a consistency, uh, this can now be stored in a, in a glass jar. And you can just, you have, now you have dormant microbes, which you can spoon out and use anytime you choose to. One thing, um, uh, so, lost my train of thought. Um, I had a good point I was gonna make. But so yeah, so basically now you have IMO2. So your IMO1 was when you collected that rice on the floor, came back three days later, and then you see that fuzzy colorful collection, that's IMO1, indigenous microorganism one. When we've combined that with our sugar, now that is IMO2. That is a shelf stable product. And you can theoretically stop producing IMO there and you will have some diversity to add to your soil. However, we want to maximize the uh, indigenous microorganisms and grow them and multiply them. And the way we do that is to create, is to continue the process of IMO and go to an IMO three. Uh, and so basically IMO three is the third step of your IMO collection process. This step gets to be a little bit more uh, in depth because now you are gonna take your IMO2 that you've collected and you want to multiply that and inoculate grains with that. And most people use grains. I use uh, three and, and think of an IMO3. Now, now you're turning kind of more towards a pile if you can picture that. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a pile which is roughly one third, I, I like cracked grains. I liked uh, partially ro oak rolled oats. So one third cracked grains, one third partially rolled oats. And then I use one third wood chips. And I use really aged wood chips that are almost soft to the touch. So the squeeze, when you, when you, when you grab a handful, they're pretty soft. Um, you can use fresh wood chips. However, because you're inoculating these grains and these chips, you're wanting the, um, our solutions to soak into the, um, the, the grains that, and the chips. So I like an older, more aged chip because it's gonna give me more absorption when I'm uh, watering into, in, in my IMO. So uh, it's, it's not a, um, so we're into IMO right now. However, to go to IMO three, which is where we are, you can't, you have to have a little bit more than just your IMO2, which is your rice and your sugar that we talked about, it's dormant. For IMO3, there are also other natural farming inputs, which we must use. So at IMO3, I'm going to pause, and now I'm going to start talking a little bit about the inputs that we also should be making as part of natural farming. And I'll keep it really simple. The first natural farming input that I like, and I think is the most important, and it is, it's the probably the easiest to make is a Jadam liquid fertilizer. And the idea behind these liquid fertilizers are, if you take half of half a container, whatever it may be, you fill half, half of plant material, fill the rest with water, toss in some leaf mold or IMO if you have it, or even garden soil. And now what happens is these, the water and the microbes start to break down the plant material. And what they do is they break it down into a form which is easily and readily available to use uh, by, your, by the plants that, that you're growing. So one of Jadam, one of their principles is the best thing to feed a plant 
is a plant. And if you think about it, if you look at any plant or tree and you see all the leaves and branches that that tree or plant created, that leaf, if you pull one leaf off that tree or plant, that leaf has everything inside of it already in a biologically, um, in a way that's already biologically available to the plant. So a lot of times the plants use those leaves as storage, you know, tanks, if you will. You know, if you see a plant and the leaves start yellowing, that's because the plant is now taking things out of that plant. They're saying, I need what's in that plant more than I need the leaf. The leaf is stripped of its minerals by nutrients by the plant, then it yellows and drops off. And that's the same premise that Jadam liquid fertilizers use. You know, number one, that leaf that's attached to the plant, that's the number one way a plant can feed. The next best way is by taking that leaf and now combining it with the microorganisms of the water, letting it break down. And then now that can be watered into your garden and used as a fertilizer. Uh, JLFs are very good fertilizers. Any plant that you grow, I recommend have a JLF bucket of it at the very minimum that plant. Now I take and, and make several JLFs. I have JLFs which are nitrogen rich, which I've dumped all comfrey and stinging nettle and those kinds of plants into. I have JLFs which are fruit uh, dominant, which I'm taking old fruit. I'm taking, um, you know, and, and, uh, and those kinds of things and doing those the same way in a JLF. I have combined buckets local weeds. Weeds are very nutritious. And if you're going to have to pull weeds and, and do that anyway, the best thing to do with them is to get a little revenge, put that weed into a JLF, let the microbes break it down. And now that weed is going to feed your garden. That's a very easy, um, easy fertilizer. So at the very minimum, I recommend anybody that wants to do natural farming or wants to get into it, start a JLF bucket. You know, plant material, water, excuse me, and microbes are a great fertilizer. Uh, so that's kind of Jadam. And now natural farming or KNF, which is, a lot of people call it. I call it natural farming because I'm in America and, you know, we're just doing it the American way. So I call it natural farming. I feel like wherever you are, it's natural farming there. You know, I don't have to, go, if I move to Canada, I don't have to call it Canadian natural farming. I'm still going to be natural farming. Um, so one way to get, one, one of the ways natural farming uh, uses plants to feed your soil and, uh, and your plants is by making um, uh, fermented plant juices. FPJ or FFJ, fermented fruit juice. And what these are, a very simply equal weight plant material and unrefined sugar, just like we used in the in the uh, Jadam, uh, excuse me, in the IMO when we preserved our IMO. We're going to use that same quality sugar, and just like in the IMO, what happens is the sugar pulls the plant, the, the goodness of the plant out via osmosis. So when you combine sugar with plant material, you will notice this will start getting wet. It will pull moisture. It's pulling the moisture straight out of the plant. It's pulling the growth enzymes. It's pulling all the goodness out of the plant. And what, the way you do that is you basically let it ferment. So you mix equal weight plant material, sugar, mix it by hand, put it in a seal, uh, open top breathable container, such as a glass jar with a uh, paper towel so it's breathable and you want to ferment that for about five days seven would be the most and what happens is this sugar uh, extracts these juices and plant uh, enzymes and it, it's a mild alcohol fermentation so it's, it gets slightly alcoholic after the five days which is why you don't want to uh, you know let this uh, ferment for much longer than five to seven days because what will happen is the alcohol will convert and it'll kind of change to um, it'll start working its way more towards 
um, and ultimately being like a vinegar. Uh, but so we want to stick to five days on the FPJ. And then after that five days, we would like to strain that. And we just want to take what gravity gives us with the FPJ and FFJ. You don't want to press the liquid out. Strain it by gravity and then take that collection. And then now that is an FFJ or FPJ. And that is now another one of your natural farming inputs, which, uh, which can be used to water in, in into your garden, into your plants. Um, a byproduct of FPJ and FFJ that I make every time is after you have strained these solids out, you're basically wondering, well, what do I do with this sticky, uh, sugary solids which are left over? And for me, another input to make would be a vinegar. So if I made comfrey FPJ with the sugar extraction and I strain it, now I can go ahead right on into comfrey vinegar. And the way I do that is I take those sugary plant solids which are left over, roughly, um, some people say one to 10. When I'm making vinegars, I like a little more plant material. I like my vinegar stronger. So I'd say about a quarter of a container of these old plant solids, fill the rest with water, leaving a small headspace, and then add in a splash of raw vinegar or vinegar with mother. And I literally mean like a splash um, uh, Bragg's, something like that. And what will happen is <clears throat> this will now, in the process of about six, I'm sorry, 10 weeks, this will now become a comfrey vinegar. So just from making, you know, just from the uh, taking a simple plant, extracting it with sugar, that, that leaves me with two inputs. That leaves me with the FPJ and a vinegar. We use these things diluted. And a lot of people hear vinegar. A lot of people think vinegar, they say, oh no, you know, I could kill weeds with vinegar. Yes, you can. Vinegar is strong enough to kill plants because it will strip the, um, the waxy coating off the leaves and they will dry out and die. So we use diluted vinegar, <clears throat> roughly one to 1,000 or one to 500, which is about a teaspoon to two teaspoons per gallon. So these are very light dilutions. And um, so now you have a couple of different inputs. You have your IMO2 that we've stored in our sugar. We have an FPJ, which is the sugar extracted, uh, you know, plant, uh, uh, fermented plant juice. Now we're working on a vinegar. And then we also have the JLF buckets that we have. So right now that's four inputs that you have made virtually free except for the cost of the sugar, which can be a little, you know, gets a little expensive. But when you do the math for the amount of uh, FPJ you get and, and the dilution rate and how many gallons of finished uh, fertilizer or, or solution you have, the numbers work out to where it's still a very uh, cost-effective way, way to farm. Uh, so with those, with those few inputs, now you got the concept. So let's go back to our IMO3 now. And that's our pile with our one third cracked grains, one third rolled oats, one third wood chips. We want to inoculate that pile. We want to, buy, we want to take the IMO2 rice and we want to multiply that hundreds of times over. And, and the way we do that is now dry mix these three ingredients equally. And then now we want to water in the natural farming inputs. So we'll water in IMO2. And, and, and just back to that, when you make IMO2, it's recommended that you take many collections. You want to take, you want to make IMO in the spring, you want to make it in the summer, you want to make it in the fall, and even try in the winter, depending on how temperate you are. Sometimes you can't get them in the winter, depending on how cold it is. But if you're somewhat temperate, you can take a collection in the winter and, um, and it may take a little longer, but you can. 
So ideally your shelf of IMO should have several of these jars. So you should have them in different seasons and then also in different regions. It's one thing to have uh, collections where you take them only from your, around your garden, that's wonderful. However, we wanna add diversity. You know, one of the, another principle of natural farming is good and bad are the same when things are in balance. Therefore, what I mean is when you take any sample of soil, there are good parts of soil or good uh, members of that soil. And there are things which are considered bad, but they would only be considered bad if their population was allowed to explode and then they were to dominate. So in other words, if, if you have a soil and it's, um, it's got a lot of mites in it or your worm bin has a lot of mites in it, mites are good, orbited mites are good, soil mites are beneficial. However, when you allow them to overpopulate, now they will push out other members of your, of your microorganisms and now they could get things out of balance to where other members that you need in, in the soil to balance it out now, are, it's not favorable for them. So, you know, these, these are, so these soil uh, microbes uh, could be bad in that situation. The way we eliminate that is, well, the way we eliminate that is to have diversity. So, we want so many microorganisms, we want so much microbiology in our soil that it just sorts itself out. You know, I, and, and the way to do that is, is with your IMO3. So now you've blended these dry ingredients and now you want to water them in with our IMO2, hopefully more than one, our, our uh, FPJs, hopefully you have more than one. And I also use JLF when I'm making my, uh, my IMO3 pile. JLF is, has lots of bacteria. It doesn't have a lot of fungi in it, but it's still a, a very bioavailable uh, uh, input. And I like using it to make my IMO3 piles. So an IMO3 is similar to a compost. A lot of us, I'm sure most of us make compost and we understand the principles. With compost, we're going for a lot higher temperatures though. You know, with compost, a lot of, you know, everyone's happy when they have a temperature, you know, 150, 160, and it's really cooking and you're saying, wow, it's cranking up, it's killing all those weed seeds and it's, you know, it's really turning into good compost. And that is true. However, one thing about compost is you lose uh, nutrients because they're gassed off. There's a lot of heat that's produced. And overall, you, you, do, lose, um, you do lose nutrients and energy when you make a compost. However, a finished compost is a wonderful addition to your soil, and I highly recommend you make it. The difference with an IMO3 pile is once we combine these dry ingredients and then we water them in with the natural farming inputs, we want to do that on, on, a, on the ground, somewhere on the soil, and we wanna protect that from overhead rain. So whether you have a covered space or a tarp, uh, we wanna definitely not leave our IMO3 pile out, you know, out to the elements. So you're gonna water in these inputs and now within 24 hours, this pile is gonna start heating up and just like a compost. However, what we aim for with IMO is we do not want our pile to reach more than 125 degrees. And the reason being, when, you are, when your pile reaches over 125 degrees, things like yeast start degrading, as well as some fungi will degrade at that temperature. And we don't want to degrade anything, any of the IMO that's in our pile. So we want to take very good care to uh, turn that pile and as well as raise it and lower it to, um, you know, to control the temperature. If you have a, a tall pile, that's going to get hotter. If you want to cool that pile down, flatten it out and it won't hold as much heat. So that's kind of the process with IMO3. 
And what you do is you're gonna keep turning this pile daily as it, as it heats up and you wanna keep it in that zone. So you're turning it. And one thing that happens with the IMO pile, they start to, they, cause there's a lot of energy in them and they, they what'll happen is they'll use up the moisture, uh, meaning they will kind of dry out as the microbes grow. So around that day three to day four, with IMO3, you may have to you may have to re-wet with your natural farming inputs and then now turn again. And in the process of about two weeks um, of turning, this pile will eventually uh, cool on down. And what will happen is you'll notice it'll look very whitish and grayish. And what happens is that pile is now inoculated with all kinds of beneficial uh, indigenous microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, and all um, which is very good for your soil. So now the IMO3 is a big step of your process. You know, if you can get into this and make your IMO3, now you have a stockpile of grains and chips, which are inoculated. And now that a handful of that can go so far to inoculate your soil. Um, so just to take that a step farther, IMO3 is the now we've inoculated the wood chips. We've worked through that pile, got it to cool down. And now we have this basically a, a stockpile of microorganisms that we can use in our garden. To take that one step further, now we will take an equal, this pile we just made of IMO3, we will combine equal volume of garden soil. And now what we wanna do is inoculate our garden soil. So basically, same process, IMO3, equal volume garden soil, mix them dry, and now water back in your natural farming inputs. The pile will heat up again. This time, the heating will not be as aggressive. It will not take quite the amount of turning that it took on the IMO3. However, you still want to keep your temperatures under that 125 zone and um, let that pile cook meaning temperature cycle up and down, turning it. And over this process, of course of about 10 days or so um, to two weeks, now you have an inoculated pile of IMO4, which is your garden soil. This is a wonderful way to add biology to your gardens. Once you have gone through and made this IMO4, now you have it your, basically at your disposal. disposal. Any, anything you wanna inoculate, it's there for you. Uh, so that's also good. Store that IMO4, use that in, in your garden, sprinkle it, and uh, you can make teas. You can do all that kind of stuff. One more step I like to go in IMO, and I know this seems a little bit, it's probably a little bit, uh, seems more in, de in depth than it is, but once you get into it, you, it, it really is kind of simple. Um, so now I like to make an IMO5, which is where I stop. And what that is, is you're taking that IMO4, which is your inoculated garden soil. And now I want to add a fertilizer aspect to that. And the way you do that is if you have manure, I don't use manure, but you can use manure as your high nitrogen uh, component. So you're basically, basically gonna take this IMO4, a high nitrogen component, such as the manure, I actually use JLF scraps. So within the bucket, we talked before, half plant material, half water, handful of leaf mold. That gets really swampy and funky. You know, I always say you have to embrace your funk. Basically, what's in that JLF is similar to a manure. It's, it's just plant material broken down by microorganisms. And, and into a form that's available to plants. So what I do is I take my IMO4, which is the inoculated garden soil, equal volume of that plus manure or the JLF scraps. I like comfrey. Now I want to combine those and then water them in the same way. And then again, this pile is a little less aggressive with the heating up, although it's more so than the IMO4, so you have to watch it. Same way, turn it. Don't let it cycle over 125 degrees. 
And then over the course of about two to three, two weeks, this pile will cool down. And now you have an ultimate garden fertilizer slash microbial inoculant, which will take your natural farming to the next level. So that's IMO. And that was a little bit, I know I rushed through that a little bit. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. Um, so Doug, if there are any questions, I think this would be a good point to stop and kind of uh, maybe talk about the IMO if anybody has any questions. Yeah, there are a couple of questions. Um, I can happy to read them out uh, or I can you know, ask people to read them. Like Lynn, would you like to uh, come off of mute and ask any of your questions? Hi, this is really good. Thank you, Marco. Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Yes, I can Hi. hear you. Um, I'm really loving this. Um, the question I had was, why don't you press the solids out of the one solution and just let gravity do it? The main reason is uh, there's a lot of things in the plant that aren't necessarily going to be beneficial to your um, FPJ or your JLF, um, you know, a lot of the uh, chlorophyll and things like that. So you really just, um, the sugar does a great job of only pulling out the, um, the beneficial parts of the plant. And what happens is if you were to, um, what, what happens is if you were to strain that or press it, now you're going to press out a lot more moisture. And what happens is because the sugar didn't pull it out through osmosis, what can happen is your JLF can start growing, uh, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say bad bacteria, but it'll start getting gross because of the extra water that's in it. So you really only want to take out what, you know, nature pulls out for you. Okay. The other, other question I had, instead of the wood chips, can you use cardboard, like old cardboard, or is that too soft? Yeah, I think that's actually a great idea. I think, um, I may have to try that. Great question. I think a nice shredded cardboard would be a good component to, to making a, a, a IMO three. And I, Only because I, I have an that. Ikea near me and they, and they constantly have lots and lots of cardboard. So great, great question. And you know, one of the principles of natural farming, use what is available to you. So when you get something free like that or available, that's a, that's an awesome resource to use. So I definitely recommend doing that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great, thank you. Um, Kim, would you like to ask your question as well? I'm happy to read it out for everyone. This is great. Thank you so much. Um, so how often do you do all this stuff? Um, do oh, you got muted somehow. We lost your sound. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you now. Yeah, okay. Um, me too. Your buds don't work. <laughs> so I wondered uh, how often do you um, do all these steps, making these steps? Okay, so okay. the way to know when to make your inputs is you make them when things are available. So a big one I like to do in the springtime is dead nettle. You know, there's a plant called red dead nettle and it's it's a wild plant because it, it grows in everybody's yards like in early spring. But then by the time the heat of summer comes around, it, you don't see it anymore. So early spring, like, for instance, red De when red dead nettle come out, I, I jump right on that and I make my FPJ. And then now I have that on my shelf that can last me for the rest of the season. That, that plant has many benefits um, like. Uh, persimmons, when my neighbor's persimmon tree drops in the fall, I know I'm going to collect persimmons and I'm going to make persimmon vinegar, which I use on my plants and for myself. So with IMO, try to collect them at least once a season, you know, spring, summer, fall, try winter if it works in your area. So you really want a diverse collection of IMO. I have about uh, over a dozen IMOs. So when I'm making these piles, I have a lot of diversity and I feel like that's that's key. Um, biggest thing, make your inputs when they're available. Um, for JLFs, the barrel with the water and the plant material and the, the one I said, you got to kind of embrace your funk. Keep those going all year. 
always topping them off, always adding plants as you go. And, and, and it's not, um, it's not a time consuming thing. Once you get some of your collections down, if you can kind of look behind me. Um, I have a probably a hundred different things, um, that I, that I make, you know, so it's, it's just adding to your collection and, and it basically just gives you that diversity. So just jumping in there and doing a little bit at a time is perfectly fine. Thanks. Marty, would you like that? I have a follow-up. Oh. And to use them on the garden. I didn't hear that first part again. How, how often do you use them on your garden? Okay. Um, so when I feed my garden, I will always water in something, even if it's just JLF. So probably once a week is a, is a safe bet. Um, I water about once a week, just depending. If it's raining a lot, then obviously I won't water as much. And for indoor, the same way, you know, some people grow plants only indoor. If you live in a small space or if you have an apartment, um, kind of the same thing. I usually go inputs either every watering or maybe I'll skip to every other watering, just depending on the stage of growth of the plants and how aggressively things are growing. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Marco. Uh, my name is Marty Dagoberto. I'm with NOFA Mass. And um, I got to say, well, first of all, it's, it's just a great pleasure to be able to attend workshops because usually, you know, as on the staff side, we're running around not able to attend a workshop. So I'm really great, grateful to be able to, to listen to you as I was, you know, cleaning my kitchen and drink, making my tea this morning and uh, really got a lot of wheels turning that, that reminded me of, you know, some of my first uh, NOFA conferences like, I don't know, 10 years ago with this, just the scent of wonder of what we can do just with the materials on our land with, you know, relatively quote unquote primitive technology to work with these microorganisms. And, you know, part, part of me, like, it, it almost feels like alchemy or some sort of magic to be like, you know, working with these organisms. And I know that the, the science is with us on these things. And um, first of all, I gotta say, I, I, I seen your wet bench back there has got, got me uh, itching to fulfill my, my dream of getting my own little soil science lab going because uh, no, it's just, it's amazing stuff. So. Um, so thank you again for, for breaking down the, these concepts that uh, I've often found sound rather esoteric or complicated, and I, I really appreciate how, how you convey it in such a compelling way that, I don't know, I'll speak for myself, makes me want to just dig in and, and try it. Um, and so I'm curious, like, where, you know, as an advocate, you know, as someone who works to try to scale out practices which reduce our dependence and our farmers dependence on petrochemicals and synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, et cetera. Uh, you know, always wanting to look for examples to hold up and, you know, to, to address the, the cynics or the, or the skeptics, like what, where's the movement at as far as like demonstrating these practices, like the efficacy with like side-by-side -side trials or with like case studies and operations that have been doing this successfully, like, what, as an advocate, what can I point to or, or educate myself on in order to be a better uh, pr proponent of these kind of methods? That's a great question. Um, one of the things, the way I look at it is my garden is kind of my trial and my test. You know, I've, I've, this property that I, I have here, I've only been on about two years. And, and it's a city lot, it's in, the, it's in the city where I live. It was kind of a city lot, not much going on, just um, grass and you know, kind of compacted soil. And with doing only these methods, I can, I, and I know, you know me telling you is one thing, um, but these methods do work. There are a lot of uh, places you can find online, some larger uh, growth type operations, which are only using uh, natural methods. And, and, and as far as the side-by-sides, I can tell you this, if you, you can do that, I have not done like side-by-sides because I've grown the same plants in different ways and not necessarily side-by-side, -side, but I've seen over time, I've grown the same plant this way and then I'll grow natural farming methods and you're getting a lot better uh, flavor, taste, you know, pest resistance. 
like back in the day um, when using like not more um, man-made uh, fertilizers or hydroponics and things like that, you know, I was always having an issue with some kind of pest and, or, or, it, or, you know, or, or disease or deficiency. And since I've been focusing on the natural farming methods, first of all, I don't, you know, I don't have to buy anything, which is, which is huge. Um, the second one is like the, the response of the plants, you know, you can see the difference, you can see the health. A lot of times when you're buying these uh, fertilizers and things, what you don't realize is they grow your plants big and they look healthy. The problem is their plant cell wall structure is, is, is sacrificed because that, that's thinned out and stretched and it's bigger, but it's not healthier or stronger. So um, just eliminating those you know, fertilizing chemicals is a big step because aside from a you know, side by side comparison, what I can tell you is you're not eat, ingesting anything that's chemical and you're ingesting pretty much every input that we make is somewhat, you know, it's not gonna hurt you if, you if you were to eat. You know, some of these things, of course, they wouldn't work with our gut biology and that's understandable and we wouldn't wanna eat a lot of these things, but a lot of them, the FPJs, the vinegars, those kind of things are just directly edible. So now you're growing plants with things that are edible. So for me, regardless of if this plant is bigger or even yields more, certain parts of the natural farming way are just worth it, no matter if they're, if you get more of a yield or if you don't, because what you're gonna get is a more nutrient rich plant, more uh, available nutrients, it's gonna be a lot stronger plant. So I, you know, there's places you can look, but I don't, I don't have any of the side-by-side -side comparisons. I just know that you, we, you just know that this is a better way. And if you want to do side by side, that's you could do that. Cool. Well, th thank you for that. And th thank you again for, um, you know, spreading this information. I, I'm, I'm happy to see you have such a following on Instagram. And I just added, that, added you on there and look forward to uh, connecting further. Thank you so much. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. And I um, received a little bit ago a link from another presenter about uh, natural farming and the development of indigenous microorganisms using natural farming methods, a study from the University of Hawaii. Yes. I dropped the link there in the chat for folks to check that out at a later time. Oh yeah, and uh, one, uh, yes, one natural, far one place to look is um, University of Hawaii, to, just as you just referenced. They have a lot of different studies. They do a lot of that um, comparison and and Brighton uh, papers and, and things like that on it. So that's a good place to look for sure. Are there uh, any other questions or should we jump to your next topic? Yeah, I'm fine if you guys are. Yeah, let's keep, let's keep rolling. All right. Um, so we kind of went through the uh, natural farming inputs. And I want to talk a little bit about um, just the soil food web and some of the inhabitants that we uh, that we like to see in our soil. Uh, once you start, once you add this IMO to your soil, what's going to happen is it's going to just increase the the biology in that soil, you know, time after time. So what will happen is now earthworms will start coming in more. And all the members of the soil food web will basically start, you know, coming to your soil. You know, you the start was the adding of the indigenous microorganisms. You know, the soil food web is basically, if you look at a soil, you start with your smallest members and work to your biggest. So you're starting with things like, you know, bacteria, and then you're working on up towards, you know, fungi and then nematodes and you have all these different members of the soil food web, and then you get into ones that you can see with your eyes, such as, you know, roly polies or isopods, springtails, rove beetles, uh, soil, uh, soil millipedes are big, um, and, and on up to earthworms. And what happens is 
these indigenous microorganisms call these all these players in and they start processing your the organic material in your soil. So one thing that I do is um, not only do we collect the indigenous microorganisms, but I also collect indigenous soil shredders, which is what I like to call them. And these are the ones I just mentioned, such as the millipedes, the roly polies, the, the springtails, uh, earthworms. And what I'll do is, or what I've done is, I have a, um, I set up a box, basically a um, four-sided open-ended box, like you would set up a raised bed uh, directly on the forest floor, added some cardboard, and uh, just a few sticks and twigs, kind of like a Hugo culture style. And then I added a, a combination of shredded leaves and alfalfa that I mixed up. I noticed that a lot of uh, our soil members love the alfalfa. Um, they already love the shredded leaves. So when I combine those two and I fill this box and cover it, and then now uh, it's been about a month and this box is just loaded with um, with all the soil shredders that I talked about. And basically, I'm treating this kind of like an, another form of, um, you know, how you have your worm compost bin. Well, this is kind of a shredder um, bin. It's a lot slower process. However, I think it's important that each member of the soil food web is represented in, in your soil. And to me, the best way to do that is to also collect the, the members which are growing in your forest, which are um, ha which have relationships with big strong trees, and now basically by putting these uh, I, uh, these uh, alfalfa and shredded leaves, they're coming to your box. And then now what I'm doing is I'm adding bokashi food scraps to this box as the food for them. So now I have all these shredders breaking down the leaves, the alfalfa, and I'm also adding some food scraps in there. And this is basically giving me a, just a bio rich, um, diverse, uh, another form of kind of a compost that I can add to my, to my soil. Um, so that's, that's one way to do it. Another way is uh, to, to add like, uh, you can easily get black soldier flies to populate a, a given bin or a, or a, a uh, toad or bucket, anything you may have. And the way you do that is black soldier flies, um, they are attracted to rotting leafy greens, such as comfrey, cabbage, anything that's rotting that's breaking down. Adult black soldier flies will find you, lay their eggs, and then now those black soldier fly larvae will start populating this uh, this mix of, of organic material and then start breaking that down. One thing I love about black soldier flies is when they're feeding, they produce certain chemicals that basically repel your regular house flies. So once black soldier flies start populating, you don't worry about the regular you know, maggots and the house fly uh, maggots you're basically going to have all black soldier flies, which are very beneficial. And, um, and they produce, uh, you know, with their bodies and as they're breaking down and, and their exoskeletons and all that, they are adding chitin to this, um, to this mix of comfrey and slurry that they're breaking down. And what that does is plants, when you put that in your soil, plants' natural defenses think they're getting attacked by insects. So the cool thing about black soldier fly using it, their frass and their, and their compost is you're actually going to make your plants stronger. And the reason you're doing that is because the plant is going to kick in its own immune and, and defenses against these insects, which are not attacking it. And it's just going to get stronger. Uh, it's going to make your plants more pest resistant. And the black soldier fly bin is really easy to set up. It can literally be as simple as a five gallon bucket, put in some leafy plant material, a little bit of water, and they will come. Um, one thing, uh, so that, so, so black soldier fly is great. Um, I also consider them indigenous because they come and just populate on their own. Um, let's see, I like to grow 
plants for the purpose of making inputs. And what that means is, that, like I said, I grow comfrey. That's comfrey, Bakken 14. What that is is a cultivar, which the seeds are sterile and it does not, uh, it does not spread. It only clumps and the plants get bigger. And what, what comfrey is, is a dynamic accumulator, meaning the, a plant that mines nutrients from deep in the soil and stores them in itself. So I grow a lot of comfrey, and that is a nice um, factory for nutrients and micronutrients. Um, so comfrey is a great one to grow. I grow stinging nettle, and that's also a dynamic accumulator. Stinging nettle is used in the same way as comfrey. I use it for the leaves. You can make FPJ. You can make JLF um, with either one. So I like those two plants. Uh, sunflowers, a lot of us grow sunflowers. Now you get into more um, inputs that are where you're charring these sunflowers and then you're making soluble, uh, you know, soluble inputs from the stalks of sunflowers. You can use uh, bones, charred bones are ways to make inputs. Um, WCAP, which is a cow phosphate. Um, and that's made by charred animal bones and vinegar left to um, dissolve for about 10 days, strain that liquid. Um, so there are many different plants that you can grow and even look to what's already growing. We have a lot of mullein that grows here. That's a, that's a cool plant. And once they flower and they seed, I actually take the seeds and I toss them around the, the property, just on the outskirts, on the edges of the property, just in hopes to um, attract more, uh, to get more mullein to grow, which is a great plant. Look for plants that, are, um, that work for you. If you have heavy clay soil, one thing I like to do is I like to use um, groundhog daikon radish to bust up um, heavy clay soils. And what they do is they form a thick root, uh, like most radishes or all radishes. This radish is not necessarily to eat. What you do with these is you, uh, you, you spread them out in, in your hard packed soil. And then as they grow, those roots tap down into the soil and they basically form a plug aeration and so when that when you chop the tops off these radishes and leave the root in place, now that root is going to decompose in place. Microbiology is going to come in and fill those holes. So you're going to get the benefits of aeration and nutrients uh, with a plant like daikon radish. Uh, let's see, there's a uh, aquatic microorganisms are huge. I have uh, an aquarium. And I, when I clean it, I use no chemicals on my, on my aquarium. So when I clean it, I collect that fish waste and which also contains that fish uh, aquatic microbiology. And a lot of people say, well, how does that benefit your, your soil? And what happens is when you add things to your soil that may or may not grow, you know, if I add those aquatic microorganisms to my soil, they may not grow they may not populate, they may only die. When they die, their bodies are food for other microorganisms that are in the soil. So, so just because a microbe doesn't live when it's in your soil doesn't mean it can't be beneficial. A lot of the, um, I do a lot of uh, looking in, in, in my uh, collections through microscopes and the aquatic micro or microbiology and a lot of the um, things you find terrestrial or on land they're, they're the same, like there's some that are in both the liquid and the terrestrial, which is pretty neat. There are, um, you have a liquid, uh, I'm sorry, aquatic fungi, which are pretty, pretty neat. Um, these things are all ways to add uh, nutrients and biology to your soil. Another thing that we didn't talk a lot about is when you build your soil, you want to incorporate the microbiology in it. And you also, I like to amend my soil, especially for if I'm doing an indoor type setup. It's easier to start with everything in your soil than it is to try to add things later. 
I have some uh, soil bills that I relied on over the years. So I kind of, I don't even test them when I build them. I count on their, uh, you know, that it works. It's been tested in the past. And basically you just want to, um, you know, amend your soil ahead of, ahead of time using one, one ingredient um, amendments, such as, you know, kelp meal, gypsum, I like cow mag, um, which is um, Epsom salt, uh, different rock dust, um, and and all and clays are, are very beneficial uh, for your micronutrients. Um, if anybody has any questions on nutrients? We can take a couple or just kind of. There's um, someone asked to you to repeat that variety of comfrey, that sterile seeded variety. Yes, it's Bocking, B O C K I N G, 1 4, Bocking 14. It's Russian comfrey. It's a um, cultivar that was, like I said, it was made to not uh, spread by seed and uh, it only clumps and it's easy to divide and cultivate by root. And if, uh, if you can't find it, if you need some, give me a shout out on Instagram and I can, uh, I, I can dig some up and we can work something out that way. Excellent. Yeah, feel free to type your question in the chat or come off mute for a moment. Possible for you to share the, your Instagram in the chat because I don't, I can't figure out what it is. Oh yeah, I'll go ahead and do that, Marco. Okay. Yes, sir. Definitely um, reach out to me. If you got any questions, hit me up on there. Try to answer all the questions I can. Yeah, I love following your, uh, your Instagram because you also are get into some soil, um, you know, microscopy. Um, and so I like following some of those too. You talk about the little creatures that are living in there. So how much do you look at your, your stuff under a microscope? I look, um, when I'm building the IMOs, that's, um, I'm, I'm into my microscope a lot more. As once the IMOs are done, I, I pretty much, um, you know, view them and then trust that, they're, that all the biology's there. And then I don't do a lot of the microscope once I'm, um, once my soils are built and I'm, and I'm in the process. Um, mostly the microscope work is up front and kind of when I'm uh, growing, growing these liquid uh, indigenous microorganisms and those kinds of things. So a microscope is not key. And I went a while without one. However, it's always, it, it just is a tool um, and it's a good tool. So I recommend if you can get a microscope eventually, definitely work up to getting one. It opens up a whole new world. Marco, this is Lynn. Can I ask you a question? I'm not uh, clear in terms of the vinegar because I know you said earlier that I know people use vinegar to kill weeds. Now, I know you dilute it a lot, like 500 to 1,000, but is there, the apple cider vinegar, I'm sure has much more good in it, um, but you use it to extract uh, something from the plant? No, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll back back up on that one. Um, that's a great question. Um, remember, remember, so let's just say we're going to take and we're going to make an FPJ. So say like you have comfrey leaves and you want to extract that juice out of the comfrey leaves. The way we do that is by equal weight of the comfrey plant and an equal weight sugar. Combine them and then the sugar will pull out the moisture. And then once we, once we drain that moisture with gravity, now we're left with this solid mass of kind of comfrey leaves and some sugar still in our container. And what we do then is now we use that to make our vinegar. So because vinegar is basically plant material, sugar, and an acidic acid bacteria. So now we can use those um, re re residues to make our vinegar. And that's, a, you know, it takes about 10 weeks, but then once that vinegar is done, the vinegar also has the properties of the comfrey. And then now we're using that as our input to water, you know, water in at that low dilution rate. Okay, thank you. That makes more sense now. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, you're welcome. Now, I have a, a question. So a, a little bit ago, I participated in a workshop where I, we made some fermented plant juice, fermented fruit juice, uh, water soluble calcium phosphate, and now they're sitting on my shelf and I'm like, you know, how, how often should I use them? When should I use the calcium phosphate? Is it for a certain time of year or not other types of year? Could you explain your, your process there? Yeah, the, um, so the WCAP uh, is a good one for like a transition period. So when you see your crops, you know, in, the, in early spring where it's just all about vegging, they're just growing leaves. Once they start transitioning and start forming flowers, now that WCAP is a good um, transition type input and that and that kind of helps push the plant on into that flowering stage. But I use like I, I like I, just like the diversity with my microbes, I, I'm very diverse with my inputs. You know, I my thing is when I water and when I feed, I, I do something different each time. And that's kind of where I'm diverse. That's why I have so many different inputs. Like, so this week I'm doing a comfrey with my plants are vegging. Then next week I'll do a, a stinging nettle or, you know, or, you know, so I just try to keep that diversity in the same way um, with the inputs as I do with the, with the uh, microbiology. And another thing, be careful with your sugar inputs. You know, like I said before, the, some of the fermented plant juices are, are high sugar content. And what I'll do is if I feed this week and I use the FPJs, which are the higher sugar content, then the next feed, I'll just go JLFs, which are the bucket with the plant and the water, um, which are no sugar. So just like your body doesn't want or can't use too much sugar, um, too much sugar can also be bad for your garden. And your soil. So just be, be be conscious of that while you're while you're using your inputs as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and Sarah asked a question about the uh, second edition of the Jadam book. Was that printed in 2016? Um, and also, could you remind us of the, the new pests and diseases Jadam book? Uh, yes, the um... Uh, this is actually the second edition. I have a print of 2018, and um, and it'll say it right there at the top. You'll see that second edition. I think it's showing backwards, but um, and then the new book, which I have not obviously have not read. I just got it. Um, I have been getting into it. This is um all about the uh, pest control, and I believe you can find this plate uh, online pretty much everywhere online. And this is their newest book. Um, I actually gave one of these away because they took down, hooked me up with two. So um, I need to get in there, but it has a lot of detail about pests. Um, a couple of cool things that I picked up right away and um, I've been incorporating is the use of clay in, in your um, foliar sprays, like a really fine uh, clay. And what that does is it'll coat your leaves kind of like a dusty coating not enough to affect the photosynthesis, but uh, a lot of uh, pests that now land on these leaves, is, that's not a favorable place. So it helps you with your, um, keep your pests down, just something simple as a very fine clay. This is a nice foliar spray. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of that kind of thing in this book, um, specific to certain pests. Um, pretty cool, it's got all the uh, recipes for pest control. And you know, with growing up the way we do, pests they love our plants and they love you know our food just as much as we do. Uh, but the foliar sprays to me have been huge to um, keep a coating of microbiology on your plants at all times. And what that does is it just makes it you got to zoom into the microbial level. If that leaf has a coating of a full coating of whatever it may be then if a pest or a, or a bad player lands on that leaf surface, it's less likely to take, you know, to get a foothold. And that's kind of the idea behind a lot of the um, methods with natural farming that I use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've heard of uh, lactic, lactic acid bacteria as sort of uh, provides a coat, a bloom, so to speak, that adds a little bit of protection. Can you speak about 
you know, do you make your own lactic acid bacteria? How do you use that? Yeah, I do. I, I make lactic acid bacteria or, or LAB. And I caution people to not be sure not to over lab. You know, what happens is we call LAB the police. And the reason being is LAB will go into an environment or go into your soil and really dominate, which is good when you want, when you have an issue. Um, however, if you over LAB, you can get a little bit out of balance with your soil and that can cause uh, issues. What will happen is they'll outcompete some of your other good players and it leave you kind of with an imbalance. Um, so yeah, definitely LAB is good. I would only use LAB, you know, maybe once a month or so. Um, I don't over apply it uh, for the reasons I've mentioned, but a lot of the things that we make are gonna, you know, have uh, lactic acid bacteria in it because it's, a, it's something that, you know, it's in a lot of the, the solutions that, that we do make, maybe not as in a dominant form, um, but yeah, you can make LAB out of um, rice wash and milk. However, my new way of making it is out of um, humic acid or leachate from my compost and, and then combine that um, the same way. And what will happen is you'll grow those a little bit more of the indigenous LAB, whereas when you're using a rice method, you kind of grow in what was also on the rice when it came from, you know, 5,000 miles away, wherever they grew the rice. So yeah, LAB is great. Just um, don't overuse it. FAA is another easy one to make, fish amino acid. I think this is one of the most powerful inputs. Uh, I eat a lot of fish. I catch a lot of fish. I eat the meat. And then when I have the leftover heads and guts, uh, I use those combined equal weight with unrefined sugar, toss in some IMO, and then now let that work in a uh, covered container for about a year. And um, I know people hear fish and they think it stinks, but what happens is with the adding the uh, microbiology to the FAA, and it stinks for about the first two weeks, but then it really starts to take on a sweet smell. And then after that, you really don't even notice it. I have a bucket that's about two feet from me right now, and, and you would never even know it by smell. Uh, FAA is a very, uh, very good input to make. Um, Dale asked a question about, you know, using other materials like eggshells. Um, I know there's a, there's an eggshell product. And then he also asked, uh, Dale also asked about uh, spoiled milk or spoiled raw milk. Does that come in? Yeah, you can use uh, spoiled milk to actually to make your LAB. So you can use that same process. Um, spoiled, spoiled milk is fine. Um, so you can do that. I'm sorry, I, I lost my, I looked at a comment, lost my train of thought. What was the other part of the question, Don? Oh, and eggshells. Okay, yeah, eggshells. Uh, yeah, WCAP, I'm uh, sorry, WCA, water soluble calcium. Uh, eggshells combined with vinegar and left to dissolve for uh, about 10 days. Um, I tried this with oyster shell in the past, and I had a good friend who was no longer around, uh, a guy named Michael Hendon. He tested my oyster shell mix and he checked it for the on the i on the micronized level to see if it had micronized calcium and we concluded that oyster shell the uh vinegar was not strong enough to pull it out of oyster shell but eggshell uh is a good option for you for sure i have another question yeah go ahead what's your opinion on using like imo with like some trace elements Say that apart again, sir? The trace elements, like trace minerals with them. Oh, and your IMO? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where you get into your, um, well, IMOs, uh, once you get into your IMO5, that's where you're going to bring in your a lot more of your minerals and your nutrient uh, aspect of it. Um, before that, it's mainly just microorganisms because you got, you know, you got grains and wood chips, which don't have a lot of 
um, nutrients that are being, you know, that are readily available to plants. So to get that, um, that fertilizer and the nutrient aspect up, just um, work your way up towards your IMO5. That's going to be the best way. Is it a good food source for the bacteria when you're trying to grow plants, though? Say that again? When you're trying to grow plants, because I usually use it with um, some mycorrhiza. Is it okay to use them in conjunction? Yeah, that's fine. Um, what I've noticed, though, is once you start collecting your I IMO, um, you don't need to buy mycorrhizal fungi. Um, those are going to be kind of already in, in there. Um, I don't frown upon people buying micro, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, it, you just, just just make sure it only is beneficial when plant roots are, are also there. So if you're going to use it, make sure you're growing plants at the same time, not just um, you know inoculating your soil with it ahead of time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry, I just one more question about the uh, F. I think it's the FPJ. When you just put in the weeds and stuff, and you let it sit in the rainwater, and you keep adding to it, doesn't it like get really, really bad? And then, uh, like I had some the other day, and and it was like out there three or four days. And it started to develop like a film across the top and uh, like a whole bunch of, and I had used it as a foliar spray earlier and I put other stuff in it, but then it really got like, I wasn't sure if I should use this. So I just threw it on the compost, but that, that's like, like, where do you draw the line if you're not sure? Well, what you do is you, you have to trust the process. I, I let these things, I have some which are over two years old. And that is the, uh, back to your first part, that is the JLF, Jadam, that's the liquid fertilizer. And I just trust the process. I have something to get really funky. Um, the film you see on the top is usually a pellicle. These um, JLFs are very high in, in bacteria. And what happens is bacteria form these pellicles as, as a protective layer between this surface of the liquid and in the air. And so I'm, I'm encouraged when I see a, a pellicle. My thing is, I say, embrace your funk. <laughs> embrace the funk because you have to, because some of these JLFs, they're funky. You know, I, oh, I love them. it. Embrace the funk. I love you it. Got, yeah, yes, right. Thank you got to embrace I, it. I'm sorry I threw it out now, <laughs> but I threw it on my <laughs> compost. So it all went well. So it, it'll, okay. it'll go right into it. Yeah. So you just went right back into it. So that's good. Okay. But yeah, they, um, you'll get that funk and just find a place way back in the back of the garden <laughs> and, and you'll okay. be good to go. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. We're coming up on our hour and a half mark. So if there's time for one more question, if anyone has one. Um, if I don't hear anything, I'm going to wrap it up. So I'll just get started with my wrap up but again. So thank you so much, Marco, for all that great information. Um, we'll repost your, um, your contact info here in a moment. So you can, uh, people can follow up with you via email or on social media, Instagram. Of course, we would really love your feedback. So there's a link in the chat for that. We encourage you to check out our vendors at the vendor marketplace. Uh, there's a link in the uh, chat for that as well. And of course, go over to see all the incredible items that you can bid on on our online auction. And uh, bid early, bid often. Make sure you get those things that you're looking at. And of course, we have a whole day of events coming up and then all week long, every evening this week, um, please be sure to refresh your program book and make sure you have all the up-to-date links that you'll need. Excellent. So thank you again, Marco, and from everyone here at Nova Mass, we look forward to seeing you next time. All right, thank you. you have a good day. Excellent, thank you. I'll leave this room open for a couple more minutes. Um, as people click those links or are trying to save the links. If you are on a computer, you can go into the chat file where you would put your chat um, and save the chat as a, as a text file by clicking on that small box that has three dots in it um, right next to where you would put your message. 
and it gives you an option to save that as well. We will put the links um, in the description on the YouTube video. So we'll have all those good links for you there too. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, thank you, thank Lynn. Appreciate y'all.